So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today on International Whole Grains Day. Uh, so glad you could be here. A huge thank you also to the General Mills Bell Institute for Health and Nutrition for sponsoring this session. We've got some really exciting speakers lined up for you today. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, we will be recording this uh, webinar session and we'll post the recording on our website and we will also post the slides on our website. Um, and all attendees will get an email with a link once those get posted, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and for the registered dietitians who are in the audience, we will send you a follow-up email tomorrow with the CPEU certificate um, as this program is eligible for one CPEU credit hour. So again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions during this session, you can please type your questions into the chat box. Zoom has a chat box and at the end we'll do a Q&A which will be moderated, moderated by Dr. Kevin Miller a principal scientist at General Mills. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers here. First, we have Dr. Callie Sawicki. Callie received her PhD in nutritional epidemiology um, from the Tufts Friedman's, uh, from the Gerald J. and Dorothy R. Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. And she recently defended her dissertation on carbohydrate quality and cardiometabolic health. Her work focuses on whole and refined grains, fiber, and other measures of carbohydrate nutrition in relation to cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, and so we have a lot of um, exciting work from Dr. Sawicki. And then I can introduce Dr. Eric Decker. He will be our next speaker. And um, I can introduce him after Dr. Sawicki finishes her presentation. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Let me, let's see. All right. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak today about um, the health benefits of whole grains. I'm going to give a brief background on, um, the, um, on whole grains and their composition and uh, then focus on a few of the more recent areas of research on the health benefits of whole grains. So to start off with a little bit of context, um, this data is from uh, the Global Burden of Disease, Injuries, and Risk Factors study, which is a study that identifies the causes of death and disease in countries around the globe, um, with the most recent data from 2017. Um, and we can see in this graph the top risk factors that have contributed to mortality in the U.S., um, and so the first few risk factors are really no surprise. We have high blood pressure, smoking, blood sugar and obesity that we hear about all the time. But the next um, factor in the list and the first dietary factor is a diet low in whole grains. Um, and then there are a number of other dietary factors including diet low in fiber. And we know that whole grains are an important source of fiber. Um, and so these numbers represent the number of deaths that could be prevented if these risk factors were eliminated in the population. So about 133,000 deaths could have been prevented if we had more whole grains in our diet. So it's really no wonder then that um, we have uh, recommendations around whole grain consumption and the dietary guidelines for Americans 
um, recommend that we get three or more servings per day of whole grains, but we're really not meeting that goal. Um, the average intake of whole grains in the US is actually less than a serving per day. Um, however, about 50% of the total energy intake um, comes from carbohydrates. And these data are from uh, NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, um, which is collected about every two years. Um, and we can see that pretty consistently carbohydrate intake has been about 50% of our calorie intake. But when we look at where those carbohydrates are actually coming from, um, and when we look at um, low quality carbohydrates, those are making up the bulk of the carbohydrates we're consuming compared to the high quality carbohydrates, which would include whole grains. Um, although there might be some slight um, increasing trend, it's still less than 10% of our total calorie intake. And so where are the whole grains um, that we're consuming? Well, um, these data are also from NHANES uh, and we can see that the majority um, of the whole grains that we are getting are from breads, rolls, and tortillas, which is really not surprising. I feel like when you think of grains, you first think of bread and bread products, um, but there are a number of other sources of whole grains, including ready to eat breakfast cereals make up uh, also an important source of whole grains. Um, along with snacks, cooked cereals such as oatmeal, and a handful of other um, products and dishes that are less frequently consumed. So understand um, the potential health benefits of whole grain. Um, we need to look at what exactly a whole grain is, right? And so this picture depicts um, an actual whole grain kernel. And you can see that it's made up of three main parts, um, which uh, is the endosperm where you find the bulk of the starch and protein. Uh, and then you have the bran layer, which is really composed of a number of different layers. Um, and this is where you find a lot of the fiber um, as well as um, some phenolic compounds, vitamins, minerals. And then we also have the germ where you find some lipids, antioxidants, and again, uh, more vitamins and minerals. And so you can see these two layers, the germ and the bran, are really where a lot of these nutrients are coming from. And these are the two layers that actually get removed during processing into refined grains, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Decker will talk more about in detail. Um, but um, just to re-emphasize, if we compare whole versus refined grain, this graph here shows um, whole grain in this instance, um, whole wheat represented in green. And um, against that, we can compare um, the composition of some of these nutrients in refined grain products, which are shown in the sort of pinky orange color. And you can see that refined grain is lacking in many of these nutrients. And although some nutrients do get added back in enriched products, whole grain still contains far more vitamin E, B6, magnesium, potassium, and of course, fiber. Um, and I also do wanna note that different types of grains are gonna contain slightly different um, compositions of these uh, nutrients. They might have different types of fiber and things, but this gives you a general idea. And so many of these components are thought to play a role in the health benefits associated with a whole grain. Um, probably by far the most well-known and the most studied is the dietary fiber component of whole grains. Um, fiber has many physiological health effects, um, including dampening the glycemic response, increasing satiety, um, and these can lead to better maintenance of weight. Um, fiber can also influence um, blood lipids and lower blood cholesterol. It provides um, a substance for colonic fermentation, which has a lot of downstream effects and is an active area of research. But other than fiber and other than the other essential vitamins and minerals we find in whole grains, there are all these other phytochemicals um, and polyphenolic compounds that have effects on a number of different um, uh, health effects. So they, it can affect insulin sensitivity, homocysteine, antioxidant activity, and also uh, tumor growth. And so these are the potential mechanisms that might help to explain the observed effects of whole grain on a number of different health outcomes. So whole grains have been consistently shown to um, 
have uh, an effect on reducing all-cause mortality, coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancers. And um, I'm going to focus just on a few health outcomes, but I just wanted to point out that there are a number of different um, areas where, where whole grains have been linked to health. First area that I'm going to talk about is um, whole grains and cardiovascular disease. And this is because cardiovascular disease is by far the leading cause of death globally. Um, this data, again, is from that global burden of disease study that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and we can see that um, cardiovascular diseases have contributed um, almost 18 million deaths um, worldwide. And I do want to note that um, these diseases encompass um, sort of an umbrella term that encompasses uh, diseases including coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, heart failure, and diseases of the arteries. And so there have been a number of studies that link higher whole grain consumption to um, reduced incidence of these cardiovascular diseases. This study here is specifically looking at coronary heart disease incidence. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, prospective studies. Um, and you can see that um, with increasing whole grain intake, you get a reduced risk of the incidence of coronary heart disease with as little as one serving per day of whole grains. And that um, reduction continues um, up to three servings per day, which really supports the uh, dietary guidelines. Um, and this study also looked at a number of intermediate risk factors as potential mechanisms, including um, blood lipids, blood pressure, body weight, inflammation, uh, insulin resistance, and glucose homeostasis. So um, there is evidence that whole grains may have a beneficial effect on a number of these cardiovascular disease risk factors, um, including um, probably most looked at has been blood lipids and also hypertension. So for example, um, in one meta-analysis of 24 uh, randomized controlled trials that included studies ranging in duration from two to 16 weeks, uh, increased whole grain intake resulted in a decrease in the total cholesterol concentrations by 2% and in LDL cholesterol concentration by 5%. Uh, and this study also tried to look at the different types of whole grains um, and found that the effect was much stronger among whole grain oats than among whole grain wheat or other types of whole grains. Um, so that just, again, brings back that um, point I made earlier where different types of whole grains might have um, different composition and therefore maybe different effects on these uh, health outcomes. And oats in particular um, have uh, a lot of fiber called beta-glucan, which is associated with uh, lower blood cholesterol. Um, and in another dose response meta-analysis using data from four prospective studies on whole grain, um, an increase in whole grain intake by 30 grams per day, which is about few servings, was associated with the reduced risk of hypertension by 8%, um, whereas the study didn't see a significant association with refined grain. And similarly, in a randomized controlled trial, a uh, whole grain diet reduced diastolic blood pressure by uh, 8% um, in overweight and obese adults compared to a diet based on refined grains. Um, and the authors of this study in particular um, noted that this reduction in diastolic blood pressure could approximate a 40% lower risk of dying from stroke and a 30% lower risk of dying from ischemic heart disease and other vascular causes. In addition to um, blood pressure and um, blood lipids, there are a number of other clinical factors that predict the development of cardiovascular disease. Um, and these tend to cluster together. And they also predict the development of type two diabetes and type two diabetes in turn can influence um, your risk of cardiovascular disease as well. And because these kind of cluster to together, um, several of them have been used to define what is known as metabolic syndrome, which I want to mention because you hear that term more often these days. Um, 
And metabolic syndrome is really a term meant to indicate the presence of two or more of these factors and um, might indicate someone is at higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. I also want to point out that um, these different risk factors tend to cluster around um, abdominal adiposity, which is what I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But before I do, I wanted to mention some data from my group at Tufts um, where we looked at some of these other factors um, that define metabolic syndrome um, prospectively. Um, and this table has a lot of information. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically we looked at um, across categories of whole grain intake, so from less than half a serving to three or more servings per day, and we looked at changes in these different factors, and we found that higher whole grain intake um, was associated with less gain in waist circumference over time, and that was independent of change in BMI. It was also associated with higher HDL cholesterol, lower triglycerides, and better maintenance of systolic blood pressure and uh, fasting glucose. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna move on to whole grains and adiposity. There have been a lot of studies on whole grain consumption and different measures of weight and adiposity. Um, by far, um, the data from observational studies have consistently shown that those who eat more whole grains tend to have a lower BMI, they tend to gain less weight over time. Um, and then data from randomized controlled trials are a little harder to synthesize because Different trials can vary so much in terms of their design, um, but there is some evidence that um, whole grains have a small effect on body weight or on body fat, um, which is important because there is an increasing evidence that different adipose tissue depots may be important in differentiating disease risk. So differentiating between metabolically healthy versus unhealthy obesity. Um, and we know that uh, abdominal adiposity, which is most easily measured by waist circumference, um, is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease independent of overall BMI. We also know that abdominal adiposity is um, increasing and um, it's estimated that by 2030, 56% of men, 80% of women will be abdominally obese. And then if we look even further at the different types of adipose tissues, um, we know that visceral adipose tissue, which is the fat that surrounds our organs versus subcutaneous adipose tissue, which is the fat that we find just under the skin. Um, we know that visceral adipose tissue um, is more strongly correlated or associated with increased risk of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, and maybe more strongly like, related with other cardiometabolic risk factors. And so there's some growing interest in the research on whole grains and abdominal adiposity. This is data from a cross-sectional study um, where we can see that um, more whole grain intake is uh, associated with lower waist circumference, especially once you get um, above three servings per day. Um, and this is after adjustment for a number of different um, demographic and lifestyle factors. And the same study also looked at um, a whole grain and refined grain and visceral adipose tissue. So among people who ate about three servings per day of whole grains compared to people who were eating less than half a serving per day of whole grains, they had less um, visceral adipose tissue. Whereas we see kind of the opposite trend with refined grains. And lastly, I just want to touch on really quick whole grains and type two diabetes. Um, there have been a lot of studies over the years looking at higher whole grain intake and reduced risk of type two diabetes. But I did wanna mention this study that um, came out this year. And this is using data from three large prospective cohort studies um, with an average follow-up time of 24 years, um, which is a really long uh, period of time. And they had over 18,000 cases of type two diabetes develop over this time period. And the authors found that um, compared to the lowest category of intake, those in the highest category of whole grain intake had a 29% lower rate of type two diabetes. And in sort of a dose response analysis that they did, they found that the greatest reduction in risk occurred at two servings of whole grains per day. 
And again, they mentioned different potential mechanisms, including whole grains effect on body weight, inflammation, and of course, insulin resistance and glucose homeostasis. So just to conclude, I wanted to just touch on um, the public health implications. Um, you know, why do we care about these specific diseases? Well, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, um, millions of Americans live with the consequences of these diseases. They have a huge economic burden as well. And more importantly, they're two leading causes of preventable death um, and diet and whole grains as part of a healthy diet are, is one way that we can prevent um, some of these, uh, this disease from uh, developing. So just to kind of conclude, we've seen um, consistently from observational studies that um, higher whole grain intake is associated with lower risk of a number of chronic diseases and lower risk of total mortality. Um, a diet rich in a variety of whole grains may lead to better maintenance of weight and waist circumference or improvements in other of these risk factors that I talked about. Um, whole grain might influence um, differences in body fat deposition. Um, consumption of whole grain is also associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And of course, I just want to reemphasize that whole grains are more than just fiber. I know I didn't talk too much about that other than the, the intro part, but um, we have all these other nutrients found in whole grains. And there is more research um, looking at um, whole grains trying to control for just the fiber. And while fiber is really important, um, whole grains um, have all these other benefits that also contribute to health as well. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my colleagues at Tufts, especially my mentor, Dr. Nicola McCune, and all of the funding support that I've gotten for my research over the years. Thank you. Um, while we, our next speaker is getting ready, I would like to introduce Dr. Eric Decker. Uh, Dr. Eric Decker is a professor and head of the Department of Food Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Decker is actively conducting research to characterize the mechanisms of lipid oxidation, antioxidant protection of foods, and the health implications of bioactive lipids. Dr. Decker has over 400 publications, and he is listed as one of the most highly cited scientists in agriculture. Dr. Decker has served on numerous committees for institutions such as FDA, National Academy of Science, Institute of Food Technologists, USDA, and the American Heart Association. He's received numerous recognitions for his research from the American Oil Chemist Society, Agriculture and Food Chemistry Division of the ACS, International Life Sciences Institute, and Institute of Food Technologists. And just a quick housekeeping reminder for those of you who joined us a few minutes late, we will be posting the recording of this presentation online as well as the slides. All attendees will get an email with the link to the recordings and slides as well as the CPE certificate tomorrow. And please also, um, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box if you would like them addressed uh, by Dr. Miller at the end of this presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over. Oh, Eric, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Slides good? Okay, so let's get started. So um, I'd like to kind of start off by talking a little bit about what the drivers are for people to purchase their food and how they make their decisions when they go to the grocery store. And uh, certainly we all hope that their main driver is uh, health and wellness. And certainly when it comes to whole grains, as Callie just told us that they health and whole grains certainly provide a lot of benefits for health and wellness. But there's also other factors. There, there's factors like value. And uh, unfortunately, many whole grain products tend to cost more. Uh, there's also convenience and the ease of cooking because we have less and less time to cook these days. And whole grains have some challenges that they, many of them take longer to cook. And then the real driving factor on what people decide to buy at the store is how foods taste. 
And I wouldn't say that whole grains taste bad, but certainly they taste different than the refined flour counterparts. So remember that whole grains come from seeds, right? We have all different kinds of seeds that fall into this category. And if we think about how seeds biologically evolved is they evolve so they can survive over the winter, survive in droughts, survive in harsh conditions, but they also are designed to, to survive your digestive tract because one of the main ways that seeds help a plant is they help with dispersal. And so when we eat, if you were to eat a whole seed, it would be essentially non-digestible and go right through you. So uh, you wouldn't get a lot of nutritional value out of that. Your sewer plant would have a much higher intake of whole grains, but you wouldn't really be getting any nutritional benefit from, from those seeds. So processing becomes a very important part of gaining nutritional benefits from whole grains. And um, when, we, when we take these and, and begin to mill these, we do simple things like dehauling. So in rice and in, uh, in both rice and in oats, they have a haul on the outside. So those have to be taken off first. And then we would do things like cut them into small pieces or in the case of brown rice, they would go through a polishing step to get some of the haul out to make it easier to cook and easier to digest. But at this point, these still really aren't very digestible. Um, so what we really need to do is we need to cook. them. And when we cook these, um, this is what really starts to break down the seed coat uh, and allow that uh, those nutrients inside the seed to be digested and be absorbed. Now with whole grains like steel cut oats and brown rice, this cooking process takes quite a while. You can see it for both of them, it takes about 30 minutes to cook them. And this is, goes back to that convenience factor that I talked about. If we look at the average cooking time for people in the US, it's only 37 minutes for the whole day. And so now you have a, a product that takes 30 minutes, you're taking a big chunk of time that people may not want to adopt this into their diet because of, it's not as convenient as they would like it to be. Uh, we can make those things, we can make it a little better and we can make it a little faster just by a uh, reduction of the size of the grain. So this first one here is farro. And if you just cook plain farro, it takes about 40 minutes to cook it. If we simply crack that whole grain and make cracked wheat, we can cook that in about 20 minutes. And if we cook it and dry it uh, ahead of time, then this is bulgur, and bulgur cooks very fast, only 12 minutes. So um, by some of these simple steps, you can make these much more accessible and easier to put in your diet. Uh, the bulgur example I gave you is, a, is actually a, a technology called pre-gelatinization. And this is basically what they do is they take the grain, uh, they cook it, and then they dry it. And after they dry it, the grain is much more porous. And so this allows for the water to, when you, when you recook it, this allows for the water to go in and soften and cook the grain much faster. And so you've all seen these products, right? Minute rice, minute brown rice, quick cooking oats. You can even find in Trader Joe's some quick cooking bar barley and farro, um, which take just a few minutes to cook. Uh, one of the things that they usually do with these products is they, they do add minerals and vitamins back into the products when they dry them. And this is because anytime you cook any food, any vegetable, anything in water, some of those nutrients are going to leach into the water and you're going to lose them. So they, they do what's called a parboil step to put those vitamins back into the product. Now, those were basically versions of, of the actual seed. But if we really want to make it easier to cook these and then we want to make it so we can so we can produce a lot of different products from whole grains, uh, we tend to mill these into, into flour. And milling really is a is really kind of can be summarized. Here's all the complexities of the milling, but these can by kind of be separated into just a few things such as cleaning it and then grinding it, aging it or bleaching it, and then finally separating it into the three different forms, the three different sections of the seed, which Callie talked about earlier, the bran, the endosperm, and the germs. 
Um, when we talk about the processing of whole uh, grains, this can happen in two different ways. Uh, this Kevin actually gave me this slide, and I think it's very useful because you can see in this case, they, you could just take the clean wheat, uh, you would go through that processing that I talked about, and you would separate it into the bran, the germ, and the endosperm, and then you'd recombine these. And, and this is probably the most common way that you're going to find um, whole grain flour in the store. You can also do this in a single stream. You can just take it, the seed and grind up the seed uh, in all fractions of the seed. But this causes a little bit more of a challenge because I'm sure many of you have seen wheat bran. It, it comes out in these like flake uh, materials and it's very hard to grind these into really, really small particle size, which you would want in flour, right? If you didn't grind these a lot, you would have the flour and then you'd have all these pieces of wheat bran in that flour. And so this takes a lot more intensive uh, milling and grinding uh, the germ is very sensitive because of the lipids in the germ and the antioxidants in the germ. And this single stream milling can damage the germ um, and cause some problems uh, with storage stability later on. But I should say that, you know, regardless of how this is done, the nutritional content is almost exactly the same in all of them and the biological benefits are also uh, equal. Now I talk a little bit about the different forms and different parts of the grain and how they uh, impact how you use this and how these are processed. Uh, so if we start with the endosperm, uh, the endosperm is mostly starch, it has a little bit of fiber, and it also has quite a bit of protein. And that protein is, is the protein you would know as, uh, primarily you would know as, as gluten. And this is really, this section is, these, the endosperm is really the kind of the key to the functionality and the properties of the products that you make from uh, wheat flour. Uh, the gluten provides the elasticity of the dough, it allows the dough to rise, it allows the dough to trap air, and the starch uh, provides the crumb, and this is, the starch is very important in uh, capturing the moistness in the product. Um, so when we make a whole grain flour, uh, these components within the endosperm are diluted, right? So there's going to be bran in there and there's going to be germ in there. So these are, just to start with, are not going to be the same concentration of gluten as you would in a white flour. So this is kind of the start of how functionality starts to change in whole wheat flours. Uh, just a quick uh, summary of, of how bread is made. Uh, uh, the proteins in the bread are actually um, what we call gliadins and gluten, glutenins. Uh, these have a lot of amino acids, a lot of cysteine in it, and cysteine has sulfhydro groups on it. And so in the initial flour, uh, there's a few of these, these cysteine groups can cross-link the protein, and there's a few of these. But through the process of kneading the dough, you get a lot of disulfide exchange, so the cysteine groups form cross-links. And this is what changes the property of the dough. So if, when you make flour, when you make a bread dough, like you've all probably done, uh, you get when you first put that water in there and hydrate it, this is you get this absolutely sticky mess. You know, many of us when we were kids, this is actually the glue we used in elementary school. Uh, but as you start to knead it and you start to get these proteins to cross link, you can see that that dough gets very firm and you lose the stickiness. And the other thing that happens is that that dough now becomes very elastic. And we've all seen this when we see people toss pizza dough because you can actually now stretch that because these proteins are so strongly cross-linked that you can get a very uh, a different structure and the structure helps with things like bread volume and trapping the, the, the air, the carbon dioxide that's produced. Okay, if we look at the bran, the bran now is going to be primarily fiber. It still has, it has fat in it. Remember, the endosperm really didn't have any fat. And this is really the main source of the flavonoids. And these flavonoids are really what impact um, the taste and what makes whole grain taste different. Uh, it also can impact the color and as, I, and as I'll show you in a second, the functionality of the gluten. Uh, the fiber also uh, provides some challenges when you make those because it's a very it's very good at absorbing water, 
and it impacts the texture and makes it a little different on how you have to make a dough from a whole wheat grain than a white grain. So the fibers, um, what they do is they compete for the starch with water. Both the fibers and the starch are going to absorb water. Uh, so in many cases, when you see a whole wheat bread recipe, you're going to need more water than you would for a refined wheat uh, recipe. You're going to maybe have to let the dough sit for a period of time and let it absorb that water. Uh, and then um, this fiber is also going to change the texture. And it also can lead to making the, the bread go stale faster because of its different water binding components. The flavors that the flavonoids cause, cause are called astringency. Uh, this is, it's not bitterness, it's different than bitterness. This is a feeling that you get where your mouth dries out. So if you think about when you drink strong tea or if you eat unsweetened chocolate, your mouth just totally dries out. This is because those flavonoids are reacting with the proteins in your saliva. Uh, and this, um, you know, this is kind of an acquired taste. Uh, I think we acquire and, and don't mind this taste as adults, but uh, young children find this very unpleasant. So if you just think about it, the coffee is very astringent. If you give a young child coffee, they're going to react quite negatively. But if you drink coffee long enough, you'll, you'll put up with the flavor to get the caffeine, I guess. Um, this can be masked with sweetness, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that different. And then also it will impact gluten functionality. So here's that gluten slide again. Uh, again, when you're going to knead it, the difference now in the whole wheat flour, it's going to have these flavonoids. This is ferulic acid. It's also going to have lipid in it. So it's going to have triglycerides in it. And when these are in there, these will block these sulfhydrils from cross-linking. And so this is one of the reasons that you don't get the same low volume. So here's an experiment that's not truly a whole grain experiment, but this is an experiment where they just add more and more uh, fiber into a white bread recipe. And you can see the colors changing from the fiber, but also the low volumes going down because it's not as elastic. It doesn't, isn't able to hold as much air as would a, a normal uh, white flour. And then the, the last part is the germ. Germ has quite a bit of lipids, has fiber as well. And as Callie mentioned, lots of minerals and vitamins in here. Uh, these lipids, uh, as I just mentioned, they interfere with the gluten formation. And they also decrease the air pocket size. So this is one, another reason why the low volume isn't as high. Um, but the thing to remember about these lipids, both the lipids in the bran and in the germ, is that they're very high in a fatty acid which we refer to as ALA, ALA or alpha linolenic acid. And this lipid is very easy to oxidize. So if, if you look at the relative oxidizability of different fatty acids, you see this, this is the 18-3 that you find in whole wheat. It will oxidize 20 times faster than if we compare that to a oleic acid. And in uh, close to my hometown, we actually had an incidence where a guy was uh, using linseed oil. Linseed oil is about 40% linolenic acid. And it's commonly used to finish furniture. And he was using linseed oil. He cleaned it up with newspapers. He put it in a garbage can. The oxidation of this fatty acid was so fast that caught the papers on fire and it burned down his house. So, so this is one of the challenges with whole wheat flour is that it can go rancid where this is not a problem that you have with white flour. And so not, so obviously our whole wheat flour is not gonna burn down our kitchen, um, but there are now health concerns about these oxidized fatty acids. And this is a, some work with, from Gudong Zhang in our lab. And it just basically shows that uh, consuming these oxidized oils are very bad for our gut health and uh, <clears throat> something that should, certainly should be avoided at all costs. So there are some technologies that will help us solve some of these challenges with whole wheat flour. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in the last couple of weeks looking at bread ingredient labels, and I think I've found examples of almost all of these in commercial breads. Uh, one is that you can, they can treat the flour or the bread with enzymes. They use a 
and so I've called xylanase, and this helps break down the fiber and improve the baking properties. Uh, they can use, they typically have emulsifiers in it, could be a monoglyceride, a lecithin, or a synthetic emulsifier like datum. <clears throat> These both increase, uh, decrease staling. Whole wheat bread will get stale much faster than white bread, and it also help increase the low form. And then you'll also see mold inhibitors. And you'll see these on almost all breads because that's really probably the staling and mold are the two ways that bread spoil. But whole wheat breads, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes have a higher moisture content and this makes them more susceptible to mold growth. So most, almost all commercial whole wheat breads I saw had these kind of mold inhibitors. These are propionic acid is actually the acid you find in Swiss cheese. Uh, so these are naturally occurring acids. Um, a couple of times I have seen in grocery stores bread that's refrigerated. Um, this is to increase its shelf life and it will inhibit mold growth. But the downside of this is it's going to increase staling. If you ever put your bread in your refrigerator, you'll, when you take it out, you'll realize it's stale so much faster. So one of the things that, that I've been talking a lot about recently is really economic accessibility of food. And um, I think this is something that we often isn't considered when we talk about recommendations on diets. And this is really because of, unfortunately, a huge part of our population really doesn't have much money to spend on food. And this just gives you some ideas on what people spend for a family of four per week. And this is especially even more important now with COVID and the challenges that people have with putting food on the table. So I did a quick survey of um, what it costs to get bread. I, I went to, we have a you know James Beard award-winning uh, bakery near my town. Uh, loaves of bread are absolutely incredibly good, but they range from six to $7 a loaf. And so uh, when you look at this bread, we're talking about about 35 cents a serving and then name brand at 27 cents, uh, store brand at 18, and then white bread, just kind of your generic white bread at only nine cents per serving. So this again is probably another hurdle to, to getting whole grains into, into everybody's diet as, um, as they tend to be more expensive. And not only are they more expensive, but they tend to have a shorter shelf life. <clears throat> and artisan bread would probably only last um, three to four days before it gets so stale that it's almost impossible to eat. Uh, whereas the additives that you have in the major brands in the commercial breads are gonna extend that shelf life. So if you don't have a lot of money to spend on food, it's gonna be hard to justify not only buying the more expensive artisan breads, but also uh, realizing you have to consume those in uh, just a couple of days. <clears throat> All right, so I want to switch to ready to eat breakfast cereals because this is another good delivery system for whole grains. Uh, it does meet a lot of the criteria I talked about earlier. It's you know very convenient. Uh, it's a good value. Uh, they have uh, can have quite good taste, and then they're also very sustainable because now you're talking about a shelf life of uh, you know, months versus weeks compared to bread. And when you process these grains, they have very, very little waste. So they're quite sustainable. They're produced by just simply mixing uh, whole grains like you would have in muesli and granola. They also go be in the form of flakes. And then they also use a, a, a technology called extrusion. So here's how they make a flake cereal. Uh, they basically take the whole grain and they make some kind of a dough or a porridge. Uh, they roll, put it through a roller. These are two spinning discs, very high spinning discs. And it's going so fast, you can't really see the product shooting out of here. But this is what's squeezing it and making it into these kind of flakes. Those flakes are then dried. Uh, and then because of this process and some of this cooking and drying, you could cause the loss of some nutrients. Or in many cases, these cereals are just fortified. They're fortified like a total cereal would be fortified with a lot of vitamins. 
And a lot of these are sprayed on. It's a little hard to see the sprayer right here, but basically they're sprayed on the outside of the product uh, because they don't want these to go through the heating step and, and be destroyed. And so they're sprayed on and they, they may be additionally dried in some form and then packaged. So it's really kind of like taking porridge and just spreading it really thin and cooking it and drying it and breaking it into flakes. So it's really not the scary food processing technology. It's not much different than what you would make in your, uh, in your home. Now I'm gonna use oat cereal as a, an example of extruded. Uh, these use a, a, a device called a shaping die. And it's basically just this big, uh, this big mold that has these little O's in it. Uh, they put the, the, the dough, the batter in there, they press it out, you get these big, big elongated tubes and then they start to cut these up. And then they put those into steam and, and use the steam to expand them and make them more porous. So these are very, very dense. And then these are more porous. And then again, they go through the step of being having sprayed on uh, vitamins and flavors and they're packaged. And then there's also another extrusion step. This is called a, a this one Excel, itself is not a twin screw, but this is a this is an extruder that's used for a different purpose. And this is in this case, you take the cereal ingredients, you put them in this hopper, and you pass them through this barrel with this screw that carries them through here. Now what they can do is they can they can control the temperature and pressure in this barrel. And basically what they do is they get the barrel to be uh, have high enough pressure that the water is superheated. So the product then comes out this dye. When it comes out the dye, the superheated water flash evaporates. So it just comes off right away and it causes the expansion of the product. So I tried to capture some pictures. It was really hard to get good pictures on this. Uh, you, you can see that this is the dye in this case, these holes. So it's coming out this hole. You can see the size of the hole and the size of the product. So the product is actually much bigger when it comes out the dye and the flash evaporation and the puffing occurs. And this is, this is hard to see too, I apologize. Um, but this is it actually coming out of the machine. Uh, it, and it comes out very, very fast, almost like a machine gun it's, it's coming out so quickly. So if we look at economic accessibility here of whole grain, if we look at wheat flakes, uh, again, uh, serving size, servings uh, more for organic uh, name brand, and then of course store brand cheaper. Same thing with things oat rings like Cheerios. Um, but I, I want to point out here is that this really is a pretty a pretty good value. So this is a product that can be uh, a good value for people that don't have a lot of money to spend on their on their on their food. And in this case, you know, the cost may be from $1.16 to $1.92 per day for a family of four. So this really gives us a way to get a very economical whole grain product on the shelf. Now, uh, in, in the case of organic, uh, one of the things you will see on these name brand and store brands is you'll see antioxidants in there because of that uh, linolenic acid that's found in the germ uh, in the organics. Uh, usually don't have those added. Sometimes you'll find them added, but the organic will have, a, again, a, an additional um, uh, problem with it and its shelf life will be shorter because it will go rancid faster. So added sugar. So we can't avoid this subject because even, even in bread, as well as obviously cereal, you're going to find added sugar in whole grain products quite often. This is primarily being added, it's being added for several different reasons, but one of the reasons it's being added is to counteract that astringency that you get from the flavonoids that comes from the brand. Um, <clears throat> so the question becomes is, you know, are these a bad food because they have some sugar in them? And and whole grains aren't the only example of a product where they put in sugar to increase palatability, acceptability, uh, and then consumption as well. And a good example of this is sweetened chocolate milk that 
that you'll find in school lunch programs across the country. Uh, these sweetened uh, chocolate milks have kind of similar sugar content to, to some of the breakfast cereals. But there's pretty strong evidence that by offering this option in the school, uh, there, you're going to have much higher milk consumption. And you can actually see that of all the milk consumed in food, 70% uh, of it is, is the chocolate milk. So this does kind of add a little bit of dilemma. You know, is, is there a benefit to added sugar to increase whole grain consumption? And, and if there is, how do we do that risk assessment? How do we know like what is too much sugar, what is not enough sugar? And so this risk, um, this benefit risk ratio, I think is something we haven't really tried, been able to figure out. But it, to me, if, if in some cases, some breakfast cereals have small amounts of added sugar, this might be beneficial because they'll increase whole grain consumption. All right, so for conclusions, healthy foods, foods are only healthy if they're regularly consumed. So uh, when you think about what people are gonna buy, uh, the food system really has to be able to change, not only to make the food healthier, but to also make sure that people are gonna purchase those healthy foods. So there's, a lot of, so there's a lot of good whole grain products out there that taste good, they're easy to prepare, they have good value, they're nutritious and sustainable. So I think these can fit in to uh, diets regardless of economic level. But remember, processing is really important in this process. The seed itself is not digestible. So there's really no nutritional value. Cooking is needed to increase and access those nutrients that are in the seed. Uh, but this can be quite cumbersome for a lot of lifestyles because this can take quite a while. So we can do things like decrease particle size to, to decrease cooking time. We can use pre-gelatinization technologies to make these very, very fast cooking. Uh, and then we can also mill in the flour, which helps us uh, get more accessibility to whole grains. But remember when you're dealing with whole wheat flour, it's not the same as white flour. Those, that fiber, the lipid, the flavonoids in there change the properties. And so these really have to be handled in different manner <clears throat> because is, and they'll also impact both the color and um, in the, the shelf life because they do stale faster. So processing is really a major key. It's not this horribly scary thing. It's really a major key in a lot of our food production and getting food to people that will be consumed that tastes good and is economically accessible. Uh, and this is especially true with whole grains, which are a little bit more difficult uh, to work with. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Decker. All right, let me uh, share just two wrap up slides real quick. Um, so I know we have a lot of dietitians in the audience today. And um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the practice applications. Um, when it comes to communication, I would say, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, we hear from a lot of consumers here, the Old Ways Whole Grains Council, who think that maybe um, you know, nutrition research might have been done on quinoa or things like that, but they're unsure about these more common everyday whole grain foods. Um, so it's our job as nutrition communicators to help them understand how this research is done. Um, and Dr. Sawicki talked a lot about that, about the types of research and that every bite counts. And um, so trying to get those whole grains in throughout the day and then also I think our other job is really to help clients find whole grains at the grocery store. So uh, looking for the word 
whole in the ingredient list. Um, we see a lot of people who hear the term wheat flour and they might associate that with whole wheat flour because wheat bread is sometimes shorthand for whole wheat at restaurants. Um, but it's important to look for things like whole oat flour or whole wheat flour, things like that. Um, and then of course the whole grain stamp can be a useful tool for communicating whole grains as well. Um, so they can see how much is in the product. And uh, uh, before we move on to Q&A, I would like to say huge thank you to Dr. Sawicki and Dr. Decker for sharing their wisdom with us. And a huge thank you to the General Mills Bell Institute for Health and Nutrition for sponsoring this session uh, which is special today for International Whole Grain Day. Again, uh, the recordings and the slides will be posted online and we'll send you guys an email um, with links to all that so um, that you don't have to worry about tracking it down. And now I am going to pass things over to Dr. Kevin Miller, who is going to moderate our Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. I just wanted to say that I'm incredibly encouraged by the engagement that I've seen from the audience. The number of questions rolling in is going to be insurmountable for us to be able to get through during the, the time that we have left. And um, uh, I guess I'll let Kelly cut me uh, off later in the moderation when she says that we need to be out of time, but hopefully we can have an extension of just a little bit because there's so many great questions that came in. So let's get started on that right away. Um, so Dr. Sawicki, could you comment about the, the data that you presented describing a lack of whole grain in the diet as a cause of death? Yeah, so... Um... Basically, um, that data was from a big study and they looked at a number of different factors. Um, and so what they probably did um, is look at people who are not consuming the um, optimal amount of whole grains, so not, not being, meeting the recommendations and um, trying to um, see among those people how many people um, experienced death um, in comparison to people who were eating optimal amount of whole grains. And so, and they do that and they try and um, control for other aspects of diet at the, at the same time. So um, that's how they, they kind of uh, estimate that. So dietary survey data, and then just the association looking at causes of death. Correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, next question, I'll, I'll move over to Dr. Decker. Uh, there's, there was a lot of questions regarding oats, and one of them that came up that I, I guess I would ask you to address is, could you help to describe a little bit more of the difference between steel-cut oats, the traditional oats, and, and quick oats for this audience? Yep. So steel-cut oats is just taking the whole seed and basically slicing across the seed. So if you look, when you get the slides back, if you look at those pictures, you can actually see pieces of the seed. The oatmeal that you normally see is a rolled oatmeal. So they take that whole seed and they just roll it under high pressure and squish it into that big piece of oat. And then the quick cooking oat is, is the pre-gelatinized. So they would take that oat, they would cook it, they would dry it, and then you would get, buy that pre-cooked dried oat. And that oat is now a lot more porous. So the, the, the rate limiting step on cooking all these grains is how long it takes for the water to get inside the grain. So if that, if that instant quick cooking oat is more porous, water gets in faster, it cooks quicker. To the point where in some pre-gelatinized, you don't even need hot water. They can, they can swell and be cooked with cold water. So as a result of that, if I'm understanding then, there should not be a difference in the nutritional profile as far as the uh, carbohydrates, the, the fats, vitamins, minerals, it's more of the accessibility of those nutrients. Right. And they do, look, they do lose some of the vitamins, the water-soluble vitamins during that processing. But as they, when they, uh, re when they re-dry that, they add those minerals and vitamins back. Thank you. Uh, if I can go back to Dr. Sawicki, um, you had made a comment about the reduction of 29% in the incidence of type 2 diabetes. And there was a question about whether or not this is associated with a specific whole grain, or is this all whole grain given the type of research to uh, determine these data? 
Um, yeah, in that particular study um, for that um, result, that was uh, including all whole grains. Um, And if I could go back to Dr. Decker again, then please. Uh, so there were several questions that came in about preservation of flour and losing nutrition. I was actually doing an online cooking class where the, the chef had made a comment that you lose nutrition if you mill the flour. So could you talk about the loss of nutrition and how to preserve that through refrigeration or freezing and what you might expect? Yeah, the, the milling of the flour isn't really gonna change the nutritional content to any great extent. When I talked about that single stream milling, you could have some loss of nutrients in the germ. Um, but I think as a, a general rule of thumb, uh, if you wanna preserve nutrition, you wanna decrease temperature. So if you're gonna buy the monster bag of whole wheat flour and you're not gonna use it very much, put it in your freezer or put it in the refrigerator. So the, that's not gonna have any harm, do anything to the functional properties of the flour itself. So just keeping it as cold, keeping it dry, keeping it out of the light. Light is a big problem for nutrient degradation. So all those things will help preserve it. And do I also understand then that the, the freezing would be important to maintaining the, the freshness, uh, the oxidation of the lipids that you described? Right. I keep all my oil in the refrigerator. And if and anybody that goes to Costco and buys the three gallon bottle of oil, it's going to go rancid before you finish it. So divide it up and put it in the freezer and it will last for a long, long time in the freezer. And the same would be true of flour. So anything with lipid oxidation that can go rancid, you can dramatically slow it down by decreasing temperature. Do we have time for just one more question, Kevin? Just more, of course. Um, so if you don't mind, I will um, turn that back to Dr. Sawicki. Uh, and there was a question about diets being high in whole grains. And do we believe that that would increase the uh, glycemic load of the diet? Or I mean, you can answer that as gly just glycemia or glycemic response if you prefer. And if so, are high whole grain diets going to be detrimental because of glycemia? So because whole grains are a great source of fiber, that's gonna really reduce that glycemic response. So the fiber can kind of um, dampen the amount of glucose that's absorbed with our meal. And so eating whole grains, including the fiber portion, is not going to have as strong of an increase on glycemia as um, a refined grain product, for example. Right, thank you. Um, so, you know, on my behalf, I, you know, I'd like to thank all of the, the participants, uh, the audience members who have joined us and they sent in questions. Um, so what I would like to, to look into is whether or not um, I can work with old ways. We can try to take some of these questions and work on some answers that we would provide at a later date. Uh, you know, again, hundreds of questions <laughs> were coming in. And as a result, we could only take a handful of those. But thank you to the audience here and, and thank you to the, the speakers. And I'll turn you back over to Kelly. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. And yes, uh, Dr. Miller, we should definitely uh, be able to collect all these questions and see what we can put together for the audience. Um, so you, the audience members, you should be expecting an email from us tomorrow uh, with your CPE certificate for dietitians, as well as links to the recording and the slides. And then maybe we'll follow up with you at a later date once we've had time to dig into your questions. Uh, you guys gave us a ton to work with, so we'll be busy for a while. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, thanks again to the General Mills Bell Institute for Health and Nutrition. And I hope you join us at a future webinar. Thank you so much, everyone.